in face to face, we're judging sincerity by how you look, how you sound, right? We're judging these other kinds of nonverbal elements. Are you crying? Can I see you crying, right? I can't see that if you send me an email. Beautification of communication, the communification podcast. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the first season of the Communification Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. This is episode two, and as promised, I know I told you I would have my thesis advisor and communication scholar extraordinaire, Dr. Amy Hubbard, on the show, so we're doing the dang thing. If you didn't get to see episode zero, the making of a thesis baby, let me just say, Amy is awesome. Everyone needs an Amy in their life. She's been the most wonderful mentor, supporter, and friend a girl could ask for. If I planted the seeds and was the one that got in the dirt with this thesis, this podcast, she's the one who nourished those seeds with gentle and persistent watering, and most of all, rays of sunshine. She did some weeding too. You can listen to episode zero if you're interested in that. Today though, we get to pick her brain. She chose the topic. It's something that she has done extensive research on. It's something she is passionate about. And this season is all about communication and technology. So we really got a chance to look at this topic, the topic of apologies from a different lens digital technology isn't going anywhere. We use it for everything, including this very important relational maintenance tool of apologizing to someone. But is apologizing via text or email, over the phone, or even over social media, is that effective? Is it perceived as sincere? Dr. Hubbard shares her academic research, her expert advice, and we will all come away with a better understanding of what to do when we want to communicate or send a message of apology to someone else. Side note, I did decide to change up the format of the podcast. So in episode one, the expert, Dr. Spotswood, talked about the impact that social media is having on our communication. We just rolled right into a discussion with mega influencer Jessica G from the Bucket List family to dissect that info and share our personal experiences. It was great. But from now on, I'll be breaking those two parts into two separate episodes. Research shows that repetition is great for learning and so is chunking, breaking things into smaller, more digestible bite-sized chunks. And the production of this podcast has always been led by research, so why stop now? It's like a fancy book club. First, we learn, then we digest, we reflect, we write down some thoughts, and then we share. So. Spoiler, for episode three, I invited Passion and Wendy Santos to discuss apologies and technology with me. It's so good. If you stick around, you'll actually get to hear a short teaser at the end of this episode. All right, I already gave you a little preview of what we are learning in today's episode, but before we start, I wanted to define a term that comes up a little later. You'll hear this. Mm, Yes. One thing that's popping up for me right now when I think about tech versus in-person is the asynchronous nature of technology. It's the word asynchronous. So first, synchronous communication happens when messages are exchanged in the moment, in real time. So the sender of the message and the receiver of the message are present in the same time and or space. So this is like a phone call or face-to-face communication or a video meeting. On the flip side, Asynchronous communication happens over a period of time. The sender sends a message, but the response can happen at the receiver's convenience. So this is like communicating via email, text, a collaborative document, or social media, for example. Hopefully, that helped to clarify the term for you. And now it's time to reintroduce you to Dr. Amy Ebesu Hubbard. She is a professor and the chair of the Department of Communicology, the Scientific Study of Human Communication at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. The main areas of her teaching and research focus on conflict management, nonverbal communication, interpersonal relationships, and deceptive communication. For the past decade, her research has centered on the role of apologies, attributions, and perspective taking in communication during conflicts and relationships. Aloha, Dr. Hubbard. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Communification Podcast. A little bit of... Great to be here. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I'm so excited, but I feel like I need to give people... Sorry, I said sorry. (laughs) I love that we're already getting right into the topic. (laughs) 
<laughs> but I want to give our listeners a little bit of background on how we know each other because it's kind of unique. Dr. Hubbard was my thesis advisor for my master's degree, and this podcast was actually my thesis project. So I owe a lot to this woman right here. In fact, my daughter calls her her other mother. She's the woman who coins my now life motto, slow progress is still progress. We've <laughs> laughed together. We've cried together. I literally just banged my nose. And she's like, it's okay. Just cry. <laughs> oh, my nose still does hurt. I banged it on the oh. television screen. But <laughs> I'm so thankful for you and your guidance and your presence in my life. And we did do an episode talking about the making of this podcast. So I'll be sure to link that in the show notes for any of you that want to listen in. But I guess we should get started. So let's get right in. You ready? Sounds great. Yep. I'm ready. Let's go. All right. So right off the bat, it would be great to hear where your passion comes from for communication theory and in general, the scientific study of human communication. Perhaps you can brief us on what communication topics you're interested in or teach or study. Sure. So I'm very interested in communication, but particularly the area that I'm fascinated on are ideas where in the public, if someone has said, oh, communication is like this or happens in this way, and then trying to see if the research or the research that I do is actually verifying that or not verifying that. So where there is a disconnect between what we think about it in, in media, it, right, what shows in a movie, in television, in those sorts of magazines, and then what we know from the research side of it and where they don't quite uh, match up. So that's what really fascinates me about communication, because there's a lot of instances of, of that. In my own life, I used to think, well, OK, if there's a problem, then you're supposed to talk it out. All, you know, you have to keep on talking. More talk is better. But we know from some communication um, areas that uh, it's not always the case that more talking is going to lead to better productivity and more relationship happiness. So that's where I'm very much interested in it. And so that's why I study areas like nonverbal communication. So how do we communicate without the words themselves? So what are we doing right with our voice, our posture, our gestures, our smell, distance between people, those sorts of things. And I'm interested in conflict in relationships. So can conflict be good for relationships? Absolutely. But the prevailing sort of tone in public is that mm, conflict's not so good, right? We're not supposed to, or we're supposed to shut it down as quickly as possible. And then I'm also interested in deception because many people say that, well, you shouldn't lie. And, and yes, to a certain extent, you shouldn't lie. But yet there are cases where lying probably is helpful in our relationships with other people. So that's why I'm interested in those particular areas. I think everyone that's listening is like, ooh, ooh, yes, please tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> but today we can't talk about it all. So today's communication issue is actually pretty narrow when it comes to a communication topic, but it's so universal when it comes to the human experience. You know, we're talking about apologies. So I thought we might begin by defining some terms and just kind of setting the stage for everyone, providing a foundation for the discussion. So Dr. Hubbard, how would you like to kick this off? Definitions, a theory, we're all ears. So let's start off with defining an apology. So the prototypical way in which we think about an apology is to say the words, I apologize, I'm sorry. Right. So it has an I in there and it has these uh, specific words that we think about, because uh, for this particular idea of apologies or communicating apologies, we often have to say actually those words. But those words are often accompanied by other words surrounding it. So we can have the kind of short, simple, I'm sorry, and that's it, right? Sorry, oops, sorry. Or we can have a more full-blown, elaborate version of, of an apology. So an apology at its simplest case is saying that I'm sorry for something, expressing regret and some responsibility for it. But a full-blown one has other elements to it. So those other elements might be, I might offer assistance. I might show how I've learned, how I'm not going to do it in the future, right? So there's these other elements in my apology that make it more elaborate when the situation calls for it. So... How can we adequately achieve our relational maintenance and communication goals when it comes to an apology? Like, what's the goal of an apology? So the goal of an apology is to repair some kind of 
rupture or break in our bonds with somebody else. So when we apologize or the need for an apology is usually because there's some kind of transgression, you did something, you made a faux pas, you, you, you harm somebody in some sort of way. So it kind of disrupts or it strains our bond, our relationship with another person. So when we apologize, we're trying to put the bandaid on the, you know, the bandage on the wound and help it to repair. And sometimes that bandage or that you, that wound repair could be old. You could have tried it on before. Sometimes it could be sort of crusty. Other times it could be new and fresh. So those apologies have different sort of aspects associated with it. But it's basically trying to repair a, a rupture in a bond between myself or yourself and another person or a group or that sort of thing. You know what that made me think of? And, and before we take this topic even more narrow, adding on that layer of apologizing via technology, I wanted to stick with the basics. And I do have a question from a listener. This question is from Liz Sage in San Diego, California. And what's interesting is you were talking about the bandage being fresh or crusty and that continuum that there is. And her question kind of digs into this. So let's listen. I'm curious when it comes to apologies, if there's any research based on time. Do we want to apologize or acknowledge some kind of wrongdoing within a certain amount of time, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours? And is an apology considered more sincere or perceived as more sincere or impactful if it's done within a certain amount of time? Absolutely. That's a great question and one that scholars have only recently begun to start to investigate because much of the attention before was on what is an apology made up of? How do we have it? How does it help with forgiveness or conflict management in our relationships? But some of the current research, in fact, some research that I have done with a couple of colleagues has to do, had to do with the timing of an apology. And, it, and what we looked at was whether or not, roughly speaking, if apologizing, apologizing earlier or later would be helpful. So not in terms of this time frame that this listener had spoke about, but actually a shorter time frame. So in our particular study, what we had done is we had people discuss recurring conflicts in their relationship. So these were couples who were dating or married, and then they have, you know, as couples do, they have topics that they tend to have conflicts about over, over and over again. So they're not really resolved until the next time they come up again. And so we had people talk about these sorts of topics and we had people explain who was the person who you thought was more blameworthy for the situation, right? To try to make it as realistic as possible. So the person who was thought to be most blameworthy or responsible, we asked that person on the side to apologize to their partner at some point during a conversation. And we asked them to do it either earlier or later in the discussion. And what we found is that, well, and one other aspect for you to know is that we only allowed people roughly 10 minutes to have this conflict. We didn't want it to go extensively. So that's a limitation in the study. But in those 10 minutes, when people had those recurring conflict discussions and they ended within those 10 minutes, what happened is that when people apologized later on, so we're talking like roughly around six minutes or so into the discussion compared to around two minutes, a minute and a half in the discussion, the people who apologized later were seen as more sincere. They, the person who was receiving the apology felt more understood and felt happier about the actual interaction. Even though we're talking about something that's been an ongoing issue in the relationship, they felt happier when the apology happen later. Now, all bets were off when when we had to interrupt their conflict and, and they were still going on, right? They were still going at it. So we don't know what happens after that, but there's some evidence that suggests that later apologies might be more beneficial. Why is that? So what we think is going on, and, and one of another study that had looked at this before had looked at vignettes instead, but, but the same sort of pattern held true is that people felt more more understood because they felt like they were able to say what the issue was. So when you're apologizing, remember that rupture, you're you're trying to say you're sorry for something that happened and you want people to see you in a different light, right? You want to say, I'm apologizing. I don't want you to think that this is an accurate representation of me. So I'm going to show you that I have regret for that and that I understand what it was that I did. So if you apologize early on, how did you understand what went on? 
Now, so an earlier apology might work if it was a simple idea, a, excuse me, a simple transgression. Right? You bumped into somebody, you don't want to wait, right, six minutes and say, oh, sorry, right? But you say it right away, right? But that's because that's a simple, you have a clear understanding of what it is. When something is more complex and needs some more sort of depth in, in discussion and communication around that, then later apologies uh, tend to to work better because it shows that now you have a fuller or more complete understanding of what you're apologizing for, which then fuels perceptions of sincerity. So then it, you you look more sincere, right, when you apologize later because now you know what was going on. And that's important in an apology that actually came up several times when I asked listeners to weigh in and and tell me how they felt about apologizing over technology or in person, and several different listeners. I'm going to find it here. Let's see. Okay, so the apologies in person camp said things like this. So Kehaulani said, not as sincere as apologizing in person or writing a letter or card and giving it to the person. And at Sina Mai Samoa and also Kristen C said, not as sincere as in person for me because emotions are important too. So let's let me add on to that a little bit. So yes, sincerity seems to be really crucial here for apologies. So it's the perception of sincerity. So how does the receiver, the recipient, the person who's receiving the apology think about the apology, not your intention. So you might have the best intentions, but if the recipient doesn't think that it's sincere, then, then you know, all bets are off. Then, mm -hmm. then your apology is not going to work. So, so that's part of it. So I keep on thinking about uh, parents and their children when they when they're initially teaching us how to apologize, right? They often you're upset with your sibling, and they say apologize to your sibling, and you go sorry, and then they might make an effort to tell you to try it again, right? <laughs> but oftentimes it's you said the word only itself, right? And then that's good enough. But later mm. on, we realize mm, it's more than just the words. Then you have to pat your, your brother or your sister, then, you know, give a hug. Okay, share your toy now or whatever the case, right? To trying to, to get to this kind of sincerity idea. Explain. So we build up to it too. <laughs> yeah, you have to explain why you're saying you're sorry. I know that that's kind of a thing that's popped up <laughs> more as I get gain more communication tools with my own kids. Why are you sorry? Tell him. <laughs> exactly. Right. Because that gets that ups the sincerity factor. Right. But then we don't check with the other person whether or not they said, oh, yeah, I, I see that you're sincere. I accept it. We just we move on. Right. But in our adult relationships, it's totally important especially online. So especially if we're doing it via a text message, an email, if there's other sorts of ways. So in face-to-face, -face, we're judging sincerity by how you look, how you sound, right? We're judging these other kinds of nonverbal elements. Are you crying? Can I see you crying, right? I can't see that if you send me an email. And mm -hmm. and if you did, well, I can't sort of see it. You could put a little emoji to do a tear when you're seeing it, but then, does that seem authentic, right? Sincerity is about authenticity, about, right, that it's really heartfelt, that remorse is heartfelt. And, and so it depends on how the other person views your email message so, or your text message because we know in certain sorts of formats you have more time to think about it. So does more time to think about it lead to a slick formula of apology or does it or does it lead to a better crafted more sincere and that depends on how you normally communicate with that person when where did that transgression happen did it happen over that same text message or an instagram post or did it happen via some other vehicle so oftentimes it's matching where that transgression happened and it it doesn't have to be solely one versus another you, you shouldn't say, oh, well, I apologized in a Facebook post, so I don't need to apologize you in any, to any other, in any other way, right, in any form, right? You, you can apologize in multiple ways. You don't have to stick to one. <laughs>
Yes. I um, actually had a listener, Trisha R., she said that she thought that it depended on the context and the situation and the relationship with the person. And so it sounds like she's echoing all of these things that you are saying. Um, another thing that did come up, I did a clubhouse room to kind of get the juices flowing with this discussion that we were going to have. And what came up was the the use of different mediums to convey your apology based on the context of whatever is happening. So let's start to get our feet wet here with this discussion about using different mediums, including technology, to communicate these emotional messages, such as an apology. So the messages, these are messages that are intended to help with maintaining our relationships. So I actually just read this article. Mason and Carr just published this this year, 2021. It's in the Journal of Communication Theory. And in their lit review, one of their arguments that stood out to me as being applicable to this discussion was, quote, frameworks are needed, which allow scholars to address how the overlap and interaction of multiple relational communication channels contribute to maintaining a relationship. And so they were referencing the seemingly endless channels and mediums through which we communicate and send messages these days, social media, email, text, phone, FaceTime, Zoom, the list goes on and on. We use these interchangeably, they interact, they overlap. So the authors of this study were arguing, we can't just study one thing, one medium. The article itself was actually about social penetration theory as a base to build a framework for the study of mediated relational maintenance. That's a lot of words, but it's how we maintain relationships using computer mediated communication. Also very interesting. We won't get into that right now, <laughs> but if you guys are interested in that, let me know in the review section. I'm happy to pursue that. And of course, I'll pop this study into the show notes as well, but looping back to using technology to communicate messages that are meant to maintain our relationships, like offering an apology. So I have another question for you, Dr. Hubbard, from a listener. This question is from a listener on Oahu. Okay. Aloha. So my name is Ryan, and my question is about styles of communication. So my partner tends to send me very long messages explaining how he feels and they're thoughtful they're quite lengthy and um, you can tell he's put a lot of effort into crafting those messages and you know I, sometimes I challenge him and say you know why don't you just come and talk to me but one of the things he's told me is that he does feel like I'm a little bit of a word ninja and I could see that it is my profession as well, so <laughs> probably a little bit of that is translating over into my relationship for sure. And it's a little bit hard sometimes, I think, for him to stay calm and collected and express his thoughts at the same rate that I'm discussing them with him. So this is sort of his way of making sure that what he says is intentional and makes sense. So I just wanted to know if there's anything that I can do to help the situation. And, you know, in your opinion, do you think this is a good use of technology or not? Mm, juicy. So there's lots of things in there. And I, I'm sure uh, we can relate, right? Um, having oh, yes. about having a preference, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have a preference for for certain kinds of conversations happening in certain ways. I can uh, so a, a kind of argument that myself and my husband might have is around, you know, if we're trying to decide on what to eat, and then it, and over text messages, but then it's going back and forth, and I'm like why didn't we just talk over the phone? That would have been a more efficient use of time. This felt so effortful, right? So what <laughs> the listener is talking about is, right, this effort part of it that is also involved in our communication. And certain media uh, show, can showcase that effort more readily than others, like the length of a message can showcase some of that effort that somebody put in and we read a lot of things into it. So one of the things that we know from these layering kinds of aspect is that many times people have different tendencies for how they soften messages and how they enhance messages. So sometimes in a, a text message, a text-based message, the, the emotional part that we might convey non-verbally people aren't as skilled in doing that. So I know for myself, sometimes I will write the nonverbal message that the nonverbal behavior that I might've done in person, I might write about it 
in the text so so that they can understand the context of that. So uh, I'd say, oh, oh, that's uh, that's too bad. And then I would put in, I'm hugging you like a bear hug, but not too tight that you can't breathe, but just on the edge of that <laughs> with a sad face. Do you know what I mean? So like I'll put that extra element in there in order to try to compensate for some of these things. So my my advice or my suggestion would be to to talk about it like they've done, right? To talk about what are your needs and versus what is the other person's needs? And that it's not an all or nothing situation. So they've already gone on that path, which is great, right? So they have some idea of what the limitations are and what they're not. And so that maybe there might be some way of easing some of this. So maybe a partner has to write when something is sort of lengthy initially, in an email that's totally legitimate and now you understand that that's where it comes from but that doesn't mean that we can follow up we can't follow up with an in-person so i would th i would think about sort of like sequences in terms of well if it has to start there great it has to start there right and then we can have another conversation a follow-up in person so then that's a way of sort of compromising on each other's needs and but those needs have to be reconciled with not only the speaker but the receiver right so you have to do both of those things how can i best communicate my message to you also entails how best do you need to hear what's the best way for you to hear this particular message so that's that whole frameworks and layering that matters yes i actually i'm going to read you a few more of these um the, the insights that people sent in. So Leslie G from Maui said that it's more comfortable, but less meaningful to do it over text. Mana G said, when I text an apology, it helps me better plan out what I want to say. And Kea K from the Big Island said, I think they are sometimes easier than in person and better than nothing. And we also had a paramedic from Hilo, Heather A. She <laughs> said, they totally work. I have a paramedic shift. She go. You know, so people were also talking about the, the context that, you know, if I don't have the time in my day, I had to leave early for work and the, the um, transgression happened the night before and we went to bed. Well, then I can text it, <laughs> you know, um, that it's better than nothing to at least start somewhere. Yeah, so it, so better, so, okay, a couple of things. So one is the, these, these examples that you provided are from the speaker standpoint, right? The speaker's mm -hmm. viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So one of the things would be to think about the receiver standpoint. So not only your comfort, but what about the other person's comfort or how the other person might, might see this situation. If it's easy for you, is the other person seeing it's easy for you as well? And then that, does that impact your sincerity in the particular situation? So that's one thing that I would think about and consider. The other would be, okay, so better, so better than nothing. So uh, in one sense, yes, better than nothing. In another sense, better better than nothing, but let's have some follow-up to that too. So there's ways of quickly, right? You say, I'm sorry, but not, that's not the end of it. So th sometimes though, in conversations, when somebody says, I'm sorry, it is the end of it. So when someone says, I'm sorry, especially early on, then the conversation often switches. Or when I've asked people, why did you say you're sorry right there? And they said, because I wanted to move on. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. So me telling my partner, I'm sorry, ended the discussion. So, so if you want to make the best use of them, then there has to be some follow up to it or some sequence to that. This is not only the end of it in the discussion, in the, in trying to repair our relationships. What popped into my head with the, I'm sorry, I want to move on though, is that, would that be perceived as sincere? So I, oh, well, it depends on if you know that that's the case or not. So you're right. That's why the earlier apologies tended to not be judged as sincere as the later apologies in our study anyway. So you're right. There might be a tendency for it to not be seen as sincere, but there's ways of making, of repairing that. For example, many of the people in our study apologize more than once. So they didn't apologize. It wasn't the end of one apology. They said, I'm sorry, several times. And when we asked them, have you apologized about this in the past? They said they had. So, mm. so, there's, so apologies can be meaningful in the situation itself, even if you've said you're sorry before. And that didn't affect people's 
perceptions of sincerity too. So it was like, oh, even though you apologized before, at least in our study, they didn't judge, oh, that you're less sincere now because you apologized before. So multiple ap apologies appear to be helpful in, in, in our relationships, especially if we have a relationship, so then we're already trusting this other person, right? If if our relationship is in disrepair though, right? If it's, if we're about to break up, then this puts a whole other spin to the, the apology and how we might be judging it. And then in those cases, some of the research, not on apologies, but in anything we say, anything positive we might say to somebody when we're on the brink of breaking up with that person, it's gonna be judged as negative. It's gonna be judged as, oh, you're just doing that or insincere. So if you say, I love you, when we're on the verge of breaking up, then, uh, then I'm gonna say, well, why are you saying that? What does that mean? Even though it, you might've intended it to be very heartfelt and true to the other person. Mm -hmm. Yes. One thing that's popping up for me right now when I think about tech versus in-person is the asynchronous nature of technology and that there's really a hierarchy. So actually my husband and I were discussing this when we were talking about this topic and um, that was one of the first things he brought up. He's like, well, if someone in, in normal conversations, you know, someone texts me, there's um, an expectation that you get back to a text pretty quickly, but an email, there's a longer time period that's allowable for getting back to someone. And on top of that, what if with technology, you can ignore it. <laughs> you can't ignore someone who's standing right in front of you and they're trying to apologize. So I was just wondering um, what, what your thoughts were, were around that. So there's some research on some of that kind of hierarchy in terms of how soon do you need to re respond to asynchronous? But we also know there's lots of idiosyncratic patterns. So it's best to figure that out for your relationship. So what, what do you prefer? How do you prefer? So some people you know, will say to me, oh, I'm a horrible text responder that I delay it. They know it and people call them out on it all the time, right? So there's, and then they probably have to apologize for that, yeah. right? That I don't respond to your text messages <laughs> as quickly as I should, right? So you're right. There are sort of different expectations around how soon you ought to, you know, respond, say something back to somebody, even if it's got it you know, that sort of thing. But it, it depends on the other person and what they would like and what they choose to have to prefer. What we do know from some research on long distance relationships is that the asynchronous nature helps us to be on better behavior. Mm. So when you have, when I don't have to, when you're not in front of me face to face, then if I am in a bad mood, then I don't respond right away. So that when I do respond, I'm in a better state and that allows for our communication to be more productive and more positive versus if it's face to face, you take the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever I'm like right there, you're right there. I can't shoo you away as easily and, and have a plausible deniability. Oh, I was busy. Oh, I didn't get it. My phone was charging. You know, there isn't those kinds of plausible deniability explanations when somebody's in front of you. So the asynchrony can allow you to be in a better frame of mind to have better interactions with somebody else. So there's that a possibility too. So interesting. And, and of course, you know, with asynchronous, if the person, or you can send a message, but if the person does not choose to open it, <laughs> then the message was not received and that was not a very good use of trying to um, maintain this relationship. You might have to look for another medium or channel to reach that person. <laughs> exactly. So one of the things that is also a uh, an interesting technological dilemma for people is that dot, dot, dot. So that dot, dot, dot can be a plus and a minus, right? So that dot, dot, dot signifies that somebody is viewing your message. But then if you don't respond after we see the dot, 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 then we're like, why couldn't you, right? So, so then, how do you, you know, how do you do that? Then you better best not open that because then somebody can tell that you looked at it and then now you've gotten rid of that asynchronous 
oh, I didn't see it kind of explanation for this too. So that advance has actually hurt some people in terms of their interaction because it got rid of that that notion of, oh, uh, oh, sorry, I, I didn't see it. I saw that you saw it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's a total other topic. <laughs> there, we are bringing up so much. Um, we're brainstorming, <laughs> I guess, for the rest of the season today. <laughs> Um, is there anything else uh, that you maybe thought about prior to coming on that you'd like to express when it comes to apologies and technology? So what I would say is that you should be careful around. So because techno in technology, there's some permanency there. In face-to-face, -face, chances are somebody's not recording you while you are having those interactions, right? And apologizing for something. But in other sort of technolo technology, social media forms, there's a, there's a paper trail in a sense. And so when there's a paper trail, there's some power and responsibility in what you text and how you write and what you say, because it'll live past the interaction. It'll live past some of the context that your relationship has. It can t be taken out of context. And so that's what's something that I would say that you need to be mindful of in terms of apologizing and maybe some legal implications associated with that. Even though we know from an interpersonal standpoint, apologizing, if you, if, if you were blameworthy, you should apologize, right? And that, that's, that's the best way. Uh, but there's other kinds of things to think about, like legal responsibility, even though we know, for example, in health settings, that when practitioners, medical practitioners apologize, they're less likely to sue. But there's still mm. scariness associated with it. And then from an attorney standpoint, right, they might be thinking, uh, that's not good. You're accepting responsibility versus repairing a, a perceived rupture between you and another person in the relationship. So that permanence of a social media account or an email is something to be mindful of. That's so interesting and such a great point. Um, well, I, can't, I know I can't keep you forever, so I would love to. We love this. We we do this. <laughs> this, this is our is thing. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> we love it. I'll have to have you on the show again for sure. Okay. <laughs> okay well, it. let's wrap it up. So what are some research-based strategies or tips that you can provide for us to help us with the beautification of our communication when it comes to apologies and technology? So one is, I would say, engage in some perspective taking. So that means think about not only how, how you would prefer to have your message be sent when you want to apologize, but think about how the other person might receive and might want to receive the message. So one of those aspects, right? So it's the perspective taking. So if the other person uh, wants to have it face to face and you prefer it to be in some kind of mediated fashion, then, then figure out what's the best strategy to do from there, right? Oh, do you accommodate and do the other person's or do we do both of them, right? We do, we start off one and then we move to another, right? So there's other options associated with, with that. The other aspect that I would suggest besides perspective taking is that if at all possible, especially if we're talking about relationships, then following up or having some version of an in-person apology is helpful. And the reason for that is because what often accompanies after an apology are relational repair strategies. So they are things that we might do to, to have the good time show. So many times that might entail a hug, a kiss after the apology, right? To reinforce, to say, okay, everything's okay. We can move on. Sometimes it might be we get some shave ice after that, right? We have it and then we have a nice sort of refreshing dessert or we go someplace, right? So th these are things that happen after an apology that, oh, okay, so then some tension is released released and relieved from our relationship but then now what do you fill it with and many times in person we're a lot we're better able to fill it with a, a hug we watch our favorite show together all these other sorts of things 
that help us to fill that up with more happiness in our relationships. So that's why in person might be, at least for one element, might be a good place to have some of that apologizing. Wonderful. I'm just drinking this all in. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Hubbard, for your time and your expertise and just hanging out with me. I learned a lot, and I hope those of you that are listening feel the same way. This was just the very tip of the iceberg, so I will provide resources for all of you um, in the show notes and links so you can read up on the literature if you want. Dr. Hubbard, thank you so much. You're welcome. I've had such a blast here with you talking about all these communication topics. First of all, high five for listening to the whole episode. You rock. I hope you feel like you learned a little something and I'd love to hear from you. Share with me your feelings and thoughts. A great way to do that is right now, while it's on your mind, write out your thoughts, recapping what you learned and how you plan to implement these communication tools into your life. Drop in in a comment. I read every single comment and review and they help me to guide the show. For anyone who wants additional resources or maybe you didn't quite catch something or want to re-listen to a certain part of the show or get some notes, I have this episode transcribed and summarized. There are time codes listed for each of the different sections, links to research, that's all in my show notes on malikadudley.com. That's also where you'll find direct links to my social media platforms, links to sign up for my newsletter, and of course, details on our monthly giveaways. As always, the podcast is available for free anywhere you listen to audio as well. In our next episode, episode three, I get to chat with two of my favorite people on the planet, Passion and Wendy Santos. They go deep about how they communicate apologies within their marriage. Well, here's a sneak peek. I, it, it's hard for me to receive an apology through any type of technology. We grew up in a physical world. I spoke English, Pidgin, Hawaiian, whatever, whatever language. Um, and I get it. Nowadays, we're growing up in a techie world and they're speaking digital. And so people like digital apologies. It's okay to have digital apologies, but it better be a gateway apology. <laughs> it better be, uh, what is it called when you're like, do a pre-party before you go out pre-apology maybe yeah like one of those those pre-apologies yeah so check out episode three for the full discussion i think you'll be able to relate and these girls are funny <laughs> this season we tackle body image and social media cyberbullying and security the positivity bias deception and so much more before you go, if you enjoyed this podcast and want to see it continue, I would be so, so grateful if you would share this podcast with your family and friends. Please follow or subscribe, download, and tag me on social media. I would love to repost it. I also wanted to give a shout out to Communification Podcast listener Jennifer Gutierrez for her review of the pilot episode. My son Jackson is here to read what Jennifer wrote. Congratulations on your pilot episode, Malika. You and your guests covered such an important topic that many can relate to. Parental fubbing learned the new term today is definitely something we need to work on in our household. The research and practical strategies that were shared will help me be more mindful about my phone usage around others, especially my son. It really felt like I was just listening to friends talk story. Loved how you involved your hubby and kids through the background in ukulele the jingle the testimonials and i'm sure the many other ways i look forward to your future episodes congratulations again on your faces baby and mahalo for sharing your gift of storytelling Thanks, Jackson and Jennifer. For those of you listening, the pilot was repurposed and is now episode four and five of the premiere season. So you can check those out. As a special bonus for making it all the way to the end of this episode, the jingle you're about to hear, as Jen said, does include my entire family. It's a family affair. My son Jackson beatboxing, my daughter Vaipuna singing, and my husband and I harmonizing. It really was a team effort. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Welcome to the Ohana. Beautification of communication. The communification.